please help me give a warm Wisconsin welcome to Ben Shapiro. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you again. Well, last time I was here, it was 2016. It was a much smaller room. Some vocal protesters, so I see not all that much has changed. I want to start by saying a special thank you to the supporter of Young America's Foundation's Free to Choose Lecture Series and everybody who's involved in tonight's organizing and programming. Your civilization is better than Hamas's, and it is better than those of the people who sympathize with Hamas, and you should not be shy about that. Your civilization is better in every conceivable way. It is better in terms of freedom, it is better in terms of decency, and it is better materially. Again, you should not be shy about this in any way. Hamas's morality is evil. In the view of Hamas, the ultimate goal is the full destruction of all non-believers. To that end, they are willing to murder babies in their cribs, and then to plant their own kids on top of rockets in order to maximize civilian casualties they can show off to the cameras. To that end, they celebrate raping, raping women and murdering children, and they say it themselves. It is Hamas leader, Mohammed Deef, who explains, quote, Today you Israelis are fighting divine soldiers who love death for Allah the way you love life, and who compete among themselves for martyrdom like you flee from death. It is Hamas leader Ismail Haniya who says, we love death like our enemies love life. Hamas brags about its actions and its goals. And we in the West somehow still fall for it, and the question is why? Why are there so many people in the West eager to make excuses for today's Nazis, barbarians who carve live children out of their pregnant mothers? Why are so many in the West trembling to find evidence of Israeli errors in their prosecution of war against Hamas, so as to set up some sort of retroactive moral equivalence between the Jews and their genocidal neighbors? The answer comes in two flavors, complicity and cowardice. First, the complicit. There are those in the West who are perfectly willing to side with Hamas, perfectly willing to parrot all of their evils, to repeat all of their propaganda, all of their lies, because they do agree with Hamas about one key notion, that the West is evil and exploitative. These Hamas fellow travelers are members of the so-called decolonization coalition. They believe that the West, because it has been uniquely powerful historically, is also uniquely bad and uniquely sinful, and thus it must be torn down. They endorse the language of radical terror supporter Franz Fanon, who declaimed in the 1960s that colonially oppressed peoples should, quote, utilize red-hot cannonballs and bloody knives to destroy their colonizers. And they endorse the ideas of Jean-Paul Sartre, who argued, quote, killing a European is killing two birds with one stone, eliminating in one go oppressor and oppressed, leaving one man dead and the other man free. Those who are powerful are the colonizers. Those who are powerless are the colonized. Everyone powerful is an oppressor. Everyone powerless is oppressed. Thus we see the bizarre spectacle of queers for Palestine. People with LGBTQ plus minus divided by sign flags marching alongside those with Palestinian flags who would quickly murder them if they gained power over them. The fellow travelers fill the streets these days. There's a reason the Black Lives Matter movement with all of its violence and its lies and its falsehoods declared itself in solidarity with Hamas immediately after the atrocities of October 7th. The coalition is real and it is in fact disgusting. And then there are the cowards. The cowards have spent generations apologizing for Western civilization. They have refused to acknowledge two obvious truths. First, that Western civilization has, of course, committed atrocities and evils in the past. And second, that nevertheless, Western civilization is, in fact, better than its competitors. All civilizations throughout time have attempted to engage in colonization and exploitation. Only one civilization has spent its own blood to free slaves throughout the world. All civilizations have engaged in ruthless suppression. Only one civilization has spread liberty. All civilizations have engaged in economic imperialism. Only one civilization has spread prosperity. Western civilization is great because it has provided unique good and continues to do so right now. But the cowards refuse to believe that. It seems arrogant. It seems ethnocentric. It seems so passe. It seems discriminatory. And so instead, they create a dream world in their own head in which everybody thinks exactly the same way. Thus, the sins of evil groups like Hamas, those are actually just some sort of rational result of oppression. 
Wouldn't you also throw a baby in an oven if you were locked in an open air prison? Well, I mean, perhaps not. Perhaps you would never throw a baby in an oven because you know you don't think like Hamas. But put that aside. Wouldn't you? Maybe. It must be Israel's fault because if it's not, then perhaps not all civilizations are created equal. Perhaps some civilizations are better than others. And that is not a thought that is allowed. This university, unfortunately, is a good example of this sort of thinking. Directly after the October 7th massacre, the university put out a vague statement saying, quote, to our students affected by recent acts of violence in Israel and the Palestinian territories, we are here to support you. You know, just recent acts of violence. No one could tell what those acts of violence were or who had perpetrated them or what was going on from that statement. Just random acts of violence, some things, as a famous congresswoman might say, happened to some people. Nothing about Hamas, nothing about the massacre, just violence of some sort anywhere, like might happen on a weekend in Chicago. <laughs> Eventually, the university put out a longer statement decrying Hamas's terrorism. The chancellor then attempted to beg off commenting entirely, stating, quote, I am skeptical that those in roles like mine should frequently comment on global or world events, which is super weird because this university has routinely commented on, for example, George Floyd or the unacceptability of racism against black Americans, the Black Lives Matter movement. Murder of Jews, however, that's a different story. That's a little sensitive. And then a couple of weeks ago, protesters here gathered to shout a variety of garden variety Jew-hating slogans, ranging from glory to the martyrs, the martyrs presumably would be Hamas terrorists, to we will liberate the land by any means necessary, presumably including burning children in their cribs. This university then proceeded to say nothing. Presumably, the university would have had something to say had white supremacist protesters shouted about George Floyd. So why the double standard? Because to declare in favor of Western values over the values of the so-called oppressed would threaten the fundamental tenets of the left. And so Hamas fans must be given moral credibility. The university wouldn't want to come down too hard on the side of civilization. That might look discriminatory. Unfortunately, because of precisely this kind of cowardice, radical anti-Western ideals are now commonplace across this nation. The West has imported hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people into our various countries who hate the West and see it as uniquely evil. You can hear many of them calling for the genocide of Jews in the Middle East. You can see their signs calling for the victory of terrorist groups ranging from Hamas to the Palestinian Authority to Palestinian Islamic Jihad. This is the most dangerous phenomenon in the West, the alliance of the radical, their fellow travelers, and the cowards. But the West does not have to surrender, and it will not. I believe that the West will once again stand up for its own principles. The West's freedoms are good. They are morally good, and they must be protected. That means opposing moral relativism. Loving freedom does not mean that every single expression is equivalently valuable. Freedoms should not be trampled upon, and those who oppose freedoms should be opposed. Yes, of course we have freedom of religion in this country, and that means that even radical Muslim citizens in this country have full rights. But that does not mean that our politicians and our administrators should cater to them. It is not quote-unquote Islamophobia to point out that defending Hamas is repulsive, or that a peculiarly small number of Muslims seem to be dissociating from Hamas or calling for their surrender. That is the reality. Reality is not Islamophobic. It is just reality. Yes, we have freedom of speech in this country, and that means that the coalition of the pseudo-oppressed, very wealthy Westerners who can stand outside with their iPhones and jabber about the evils of Israel can scream and shout outside. More power to them. They should enjoy the, uh, It's a little cold outside. I hope they enjoy themselves. It also means the rest of us can recognize that support for terrorist organizations puts you well outside the so-called Overton window. Nobody has the moral obligation to hire a Hamas supporter. Now, if you're not a citizen, different story. Our civilization has no duty to welcome you in or support you if you support Hamas. You should be deported forthwith to a place more in line with the values you apparently treasure. The West has a long history of resilience. The West should not and will not go down without a fight. But that requires actual moral courage. That requires recognizing the greatness of the West and not being shy about proclaiming that greatness in the face of alternatives. It requires moral clarity. It requires the tough business of saying things that are true. If the West does say things that are true, the West will emerge successful and stronger than before. If the West does not, it will fall to the darkness. Thanks so much. Happy to take all your questions. There is a great evil in the world going on all the time, and that is the evil of abortion. But little things can make a big difference. When you sponsor an ultrasound at Preborn, your gift, no matter how small, makes a difference in a very large way. Who will that baby become? What life will the baby live? And what about the mom? A small donation of just 28 bucks gives a mom the opportunity to meet her child through ultrasound, which could help double a baby's chance at life. If you haven't seen the modern ultrasounds, it's been a while. I gotta tell you, they're unbelievable. We have four kids. We met all of them well before they were born because of the magic of ultrasound. It does change your perspective on everything 
up to and including life itself. Get involved today by dialing pound 250, say keyword baby. That's pound 250 baby or go to preborn.com slash Ben. That's preborn.com slash Ben. Again, Preborn will take it from there as soon as you make that life-saving donation. They have a network of clinics that rescues 200 babies every single day. It's the best 28 bucks you're going to spend. And if you have a lot more to give, then give a lot more. Go to preborn.com slash Ben right now. It's preborn.com slash Ben. Mr. Shapiro. Mr. Shapiro will be happy to take your questions now. If you have a question, please use the aisle closest to you to file to the back of the room where my colleague is. When you are ready for your question, you can come down the aisle, but only when it's your turn. You'll stand on this mark, and I will hold the microphone for you. And as always, if you disagree, you go to the front of the line. I don't think I should be at the front of the line. Um, what would you say to young Americans who are afraid of negative social and academic repercussions if they speak out about what they believe to be true? So I think that there is a new, more muscular business community that is beginning to actually awaken from its stupor. So the business community has been taken over by a lot of people in the recent past who are deeply afraid of diversity lawsuits, they're deeply afraid of legal liability, they're afraid of HR issues. I think you're starting to see a lot of businesses emerge and awaken from that. And I think a lot of businesses are perfectly willing to hire people who are reasonable. And I think that that's going to continue in the near future. That's, that's my great hope. I think the business community is starting to turn. They've had enough of this stuff. It turns out that when the money is free and easy, it's very easy to spend millions of dollars on DEI seminars that teach you to hate white people or whatever. But it turns out that when the money gets tight, then people don't want to do that as much. And they'd rather just hire, you know, a productive employee who might believe that the American flag is decent. Thank you. Thank I you. appreciate it. Hey, Ben. Um, this week in Israel, they reported that like 76% of Israelis thought that Netanyahu should step down. And mm -hmm. I'm curious, like, because Israel doesn't have a figurehead like Zelensky to rally around, is Netanyahu doing more harm than good? Also, I'm curious if you would have on Dean Phillips for a uh, Sunday special. Uh, so I'm not really aware of Dean Phillips other than he's running against Biden, right? That, that's, that, that's the guy. I didn't hear of him until he ran right, against right. Biden. So... Sure, I guess, why not? I mean, sure, yeah. okay. But in any case, um, it, as far as Netanyahu, the reason that Israelis are very anti-Netanyahu is that Israelis actually are reacting the way that I would hope that Americans reacted to bad presidents, which is when a president fails, they get very angry at it. So this is the single greatest security failure, failure in Israeli history. And so even a lot of people who voted for Netanyahu in Israel are now very anti-Netanyahu. Now, the way that it works in Israel is because they have a coalition government they actually have to have a vote of no confidence, and then a majority has to vote Netanyahu out. That's not going to happen right now. But whenever people on the left or in the media start talking about the right-wing Netanyahu government, that's ridiculous and ignorant, considering that right now they have a unity government that includes Benny Gantz, who's on the center left. Right? The fact is that Israel has come together in incredible ways. In the after it reminds me of 9-11 of in the United States. Like People came together for a hot second here. I think it's going to last a lot longer there, because the truth is that as devastating as 9-11 was for the United States, Israel's a much, much smaller country. And so in terms of sort of the feeling of insecurity, they're also surrounded on every border by, by people who don't like them very much. Uh, and so I, I think that the, the future of the state of Israel is going to be a lot more unified. But yeah, I mean, Netanyahu is going to take a serious political hit at some point in the future. Uh, what about like internationally? Uh, I mean, internationally, I think people are looking for an excuse to, to be putting pressure on Israel because the easiest solution is always weapons down, everybody calm down, a few Jews got killed, but whatever, we don't want this thing to escalate. The reality is what is in the best interest of pretty much everybody, except for the Iranians, is for Hamas to be destroyed completely and utterly. That's in the best interest of the Europeans. It's in the... It's in everybody's best interest, including, including by the way, Sunni governments. <laughs> Hello, Ben. My name is Tyler. It's an honor to get to speak to you tonight. Uh, my question's over uh, right-wing populism within the future of the conservative party. Um, over the last decade, through the rise of figures like Donald Trump, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and Josh Hawley, we have seen a rise in right-wing populism, especially with young people, challenging the traditional conservatism of the Republican Party. What do you think will be the outcome of this internal identity struggle for the party as a whole? So the, the, the weird thing that's, that's so strange about, for example, the triumvirate of people you just mentioned, Trump and Marjorie Taylor Greene and Josh Hawley, is there are actually pretty significant disagreements between them on policy. Foreign policy would be a good example. Trump, for example, was extremely pro-Israel. Marjorie Taylor Greene is kind of somewhere there, and Hawley is, is pro-Israel, but also tends to be more isolationist generally than Trump was on foreign policy. When it comes to spending habits, 
Hawley is, is less big government than Trump is. What, is what, what populism is is a tactic. It's not an actual philosophy. Populism is just a tactic where you basically say, the people are the, are the final repository of all wisdom, and so I'm going to you, the people, as opposed to the elites. And you can see populism used by, for example, Bernie Sanders, right? This is Sanders' shtick also. It's just from the left. And so I'm not sure what to make of populism as a political movement in terms of its actual policy recommendations, because you do see a wide variety of figures who have tried to kind of engage with that populist wave. I think the Republicans who dismiss it, who pretend that they don't have to speak to it, are going to do very poorly. At the same time, I don't, I, I don't think that Trumpism is a philosophy. Trumpism is an impulse. And I, I think the impulse is sometimes good, but it's, it's reactive. It's reactionary in nature. And so that's why, for example, you'll see in the Republican Party that the more somebody is criticized, the more Republicans start to resonate to that person, whether or not they're dumb. Right? This happens a lot. Like you'll, you'll have Lauren Boebert. And Lauren Boebert, I mean, I, I hate to break it to you guys. Lauren Boebert ain't like the brightest egg in the, in the carton. And, <laughs> and, I mean, just Google Lauren Boebert Beetlejuice concert. And, and in any case... Lauren Boebert, like there's a mass support for her that came out from kind of the hard right once she was attacked by the left. And you know, it seems to me that we shouldn't measure the greatness or goodness of our politicians by how much the left hates them. That can be an early indicator that maybe they might be worth looking at, but that shouldn't be sort of the final judgment call. They really, really hate this guy, therefore he is good. It seems to me that they really, really hate that guy, therefore they hate that guy is more accurate. Thank you very much. Hello, Ben. Uh, there was a time where the word mother exclusively described a woman in relation to her biological offspring, but our definition has since shifted to account for adoption, leaving us with a more social and less biological outlook on motherhood. My question for you is how affirming transgender identity is such a threat to biology when we have clear precedent for similar shifts in language? Okay, so usually there is a distinction. You, you can call somebody mother, but then an adoptive mother is not gonna be insulted when you say biological mother. Right. An adopted mother is not going to say that biological mother is an inappropriate term. The trans movement claims that the term biological female is somehow offensive. The, the trans movement will claim that female encompasses not biology somehow. It's, it's a bizarrely illogical categorization. So the trans movement is not a threat to biology. Biology is biology. People will continue to reproduce. I mean, some of us. But in any case, the... the no implication made. But in any case, the... So, some people will, people will continue to reproduce. Those reproductive, these, those reproductive relationships will be almost entirely male-female. Uh, the, the, the only exceptions would be in vitro or artificial insemination, which will be an extraordinarily tiny percentage of, of actual inseminations and pregnancies. So biology is not threatened. Truth is threatened. I'm not worried about biology being threatened. If you want to threaten your own biology, I mean, that's, that's your prerogative. But truth, the idea that male refers to a biological a biological category as opposed to an idea that you have in your head that is unverifiable by any sort of objective reality. That is something that, that nobody who cares about truth should acquiesce to. The entire, the entire way that we communicate is through words that have mutually agreed upon definitions. And the definition of a word cannot be a, a, in, in a Ouroboros that eats itself. It can't be a woman is anyone who says they are a woman, which is a woman. It's completely circular. That has no definition. If you want to define a category, the category has to have definition. And any attempt to broaden that category out to include things that are clearly not in that category, and in fact, there are only two categories, male and female, they're actually in the other category, that, that is a fundamental assault on the truth, and nobody should accept that. Um. In one of your more infamous debates, you said, I'm not going to modify basic biology because it threatens your subjective sense of what you are. Yes. Uh, my argument is not that terms like biological female or biological male are necessarily offensive. My argument is that um, you are saying that s referring to a trans woman as a woman or a trans man or as a man or et cetera, et cetera, is like inherently offensive or threatens biology. And I'm curious why why, um, why it's so threatened when there's clear precedent for changing the language. Again, or, the, or the, 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 term, the term mother does not include father. Every category has to have boundaries. The boundary of female starts at male. And when you start including male in the category of female, you are threatening biological definitions as well as basic truth. Well, you could say the category of mother starts at conception or you know, a biological relation to an offspring. But as we know... Um, but again, the idea that you are, but the, again, the, the idea of motherhood being the act of mothering, right, and that is, is a female. A female does the act of mothering. 
You can say that a female who does the act of mothering is a mother, but you also have a special category called biological motherhood. I'm not going to say that an adoptive mom and a biological mom have precisely the same definition. They don't. They're underneath a subset of category called motherhood. That motherhood sometimes involves birth, sometimes it does not, but it certainly involves being a female. What do you think about the distinction between cis women and trans women? Explain. Um, well, you're saying... <laughs> You're saying, that, um, you're saying that a more inclusive usage of the word mother isn't particularly offensive because we also have biological mother. Um, yes. We've offered the term cis woman and even biological woman or assigned female at birth. We've offered a variety of terms that okay. properly categorize people Again, who... you cannot extend the term woman to apply to a biological male. Every category has an endpoint. If there are only two categories, male and female, and you say that female now is in this category, there are no definitions. There are no definitions. I mean, to, to paraphrase my friend Matt Walsh, I'm going to need you to explain what a woman is without reference to the word woman. We can go on all, all day like this, but... Um, yeah. Well, I wouldn't say it's necessarily circular to say that a woman is someone who exhibits womanhood. Yes, it is. Um, and that... It's definitionally <laughs> circular. <laughs> well... Uh, my That's argument, like saying a hand is something that, defi that, that fundamentally shows handhood. Well, what I a have tree to say, is something that demonstrates the qualities of treehood. What, what, new, what new actual definitional content woman, have you added to the word? I can define womanhood for you, which is a set of characteristics associated with females and a woman as someone who exhibits said womanhood. Okay, well, you have just used the word female and woman to define each other. So you say a woman is a female, but not a biological female. A female is a woman and a woman is a female, but at no point have you added any new say, content. No, I said a woman is someone who exhibits womanhood and womanhood is a set of characteristics. Yes, and that, that doesn't mean anything. Why does, a, how does a, it not the, mean The reason anything? it doesn't mean, okay. Again, again, a dog is a thing that exhibits the characteristics of doghood. It's a set of characteristics characterized by being a dog. I've added no content to that. If you have no idea what a dog is, you still have no idea what a dog there are plenty, is. There are plenty of labels that refer to concepts. This is not a new thing. It's not a label referring to a concept. It's a label that's referring to the same word as the concept. You can't do that. It's I'm not fundamentally referring circular. to the same word. I'm saying that womanhood... You have not defined even womanhood. You say it's a set of characteristics that applies to females, and then you're applying it to males. So clearly this is nonsensical. I'm sorry that it doesn't... I'm sorry that, that, your, that your attempts to worm a definition into nonsense are not succeeding, but like... I can't make that fit into logic because it doesn't. I mean, I'm sorry. Hi there. All right, so Wisconsin was in like a $7 billion budget, and yet the, a lot of the smaller two-year trade schools in the UW system and like four-year engineering, school, engineering schools are losing money. They're firing people. They're like leaving, uh, getting less students. And this is because the legislature, Republican legislature, didn't increase funding. They decreased it in hopes to get rid of the DEI department. Mm -hmm. I go here. DEI department's like not that big of a deal. Like, if you want to go, you can. If you don't want to go, you can kind of just avoid it. Is it really worth, like, lowering educational opportunities for people, raising tuitions, and decreasing enrollment in, like, very important trade schools for the purpose of, like, ending DEI at a school where the value is still going to be here? So you're, you're asking the wrong guy. I think that every major okay. university in the United States should cut its entire liberal arts department and tell people to get a life. <laughs> Meaning that... That's... I, yeah, I mean, but, that's like, but I'm saying... But, I mean, but there's, again... But there's... It's right, a, like, but there's smaller uh, universities, though, that... Uh, but, you know, I understand. Yeah. My feeling about college is very simple. If you are able to get somebody to give you a loan to go to the school because they feel that your degree is then going to allow you a higher right. earning level, then that seems to me a good use of dollars. Subsidizing people's education, where a bank would not, very often is a giant waste of money. And so the amount of money that's wasted in state schooling systems so that people can get a degree in lesbian dance theory or whatever is silly. And, and, and right. furthermore, if you're, if you're majoring in engineering, so to give you an example, I was able to get private loans to go to Harvard Law School. Why? Because they knew when I got out of the other end of Harvard Law School, I was going to earn a bunch of money because I went to Harvard Law School. Okay, the, the same thing isn't necessarily true if you're majoring in poli-sci at a state school. Right? You're still Dude, I majored in poli-sci too. There we go, bro. So here's the... So here's the thing. You're going to finish up in poli-sci, and then you're going to go to a real school doing real things. Yeah. Okay? And you're probably going to go to law school, or you're going to go work in business, or you're going to get an apprenticeship somewhere. And here's the reality. The entire college system is a credentialing scam. Unless you are in the hard sciences, the entire college system should be done away with, and people should go directly into the workforce where they learn how to do a job. Yeah. So I... 
if, if you want me to, like, go back, I can. I feel like you didn't fully answer my question because I'm more saying I agree with you that, like, trade schools are really important for a community, but I'm saying that the smaller ones rely on, like, the subsidies from the government to stay afloat, and they're currently not getting it because of, like, this, like, moral war between, like, Robin Voss and the Republicans and right. the Tony Evers about, like, you know, DEI here. I feel like there's a ton of people who don't really care, and they want to go to a smaller school in their hometown and learn how to do a trade. I hear you. And they and, can. And I, I'm just saying I'm more right. extreme than the Republican legislature, and I would slash and okay. burn my way through Fair the college enough. budgets. Fair enough. All right. <laughs> All right. That's, hey, you have a good one. Hey, Ben Shapiro. I just had a quick question for you. So I, I have a question. Can I see your face, or is it, like, prohibited? Um, I just don't want to associate my face with, like, my politics. Is there a reason for that? I just don't want, like, worried about my career. Is that okay? Um, well, it depends about what you're, what you're about to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so can I just ask it? Okay. Yeah, you, you can ask it, and then we'll determine whether, uh, whether you are a, a person who should not be able to get a job. Okay. Sure. <laughs> okay. So I just want to know, how hard was it to, like, generate, generate like, AI-generated images of... Hamas so you should take off your mask now. Be, not, not really because what you're saying is so anti-Semitic, but just because what you're saying is so unbelievably stupid that I hope employers take a good stock of a person who does something so dumb. So the... No? No, ma no mask stays on? Mask stays on? Yeah, I figured. Okay. There was no AI-generated image. It is a real image. The way that the game works on Twitter right now, because it's been taken over by a lot of Hamas bots, is that if you put a real image of an atrocity, they will then spam that image with community notes. And they'll do that until the algorithm puts a community note on the image. And then they'll screen cap the community note and pretend that the image was AI generated. That image was not only a not AI generated, it was handed to Tony Blinken. That, Im th that image was specifically, I, I wasn't the first person to put it out there. That image was tweeted out by the Prime Minister of Israel. So, like, again, this is the, the amount of, of just insane bullshit that's being trafficked in this, in this information war is truly astonishing. And the fact that there are people who don't want to show their faces, but they do want to say things like that, you know, again, you know, I, I, let's just, just leave it, we'll leave it at that. This does not appear to be a highly intelligent specimen. Okay. <laughs> Hey, Ben, my name's Luke, and I'm not scared to show my face out here. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, disregarding the popularity going into the 2024 election, who do you believe it would be best fit to be the next president of the United States? Who'd be best fit to be? I mean, put it, putting aside the popularity... Other popula than yourself. <laughs> I'm not running. Uh, aside, uh, um, I, I, it sounds like the most miserable job in the world, by the way. That's, it sounds absolutely miserable, and I have four kids, and, and I'm very busy. But in any case, um, the, the, who would be the best president, and who is likely to win are obviously two very different questions. Uh, the person I believe would be the best president right now, it would be DeSantis. I think DeSantis has been an excellent and effective governor of my home state of Florida. I think that he's done a terrific job in mobilizing the executive branch in order to get done what he needs to get done. He knows how to govern. He knows how to actually do the administrative duties that the executive branch is supposed to carry forth. Who is most likely to win at this point? If you had asked me four months ago, I would have said that Biden had a clear advantage because the fact is that Donald Trump lost the last election cycle. And so the idea that he was going to suddenly flip a huge percentage of the electorate in his favor, being as toxic personally as he, as he is, according to the polling data, I thought that that was kind of a fool's errand. Now, is it possible that Joe Biden is just such a bad president that it flips over to Trump? It's certainly possible. Now, it's a little bit early to say. The reason I'm saying it's early to say is because right now, all of the focus is on how terrible everything is in the world. I mean, you walk into the daily headlines and it's like that dog meme in the middle of like the burning building, right? It's like everything is just on fire and terrible. But after a year of nothing but Donald Trump in court saying ridiculous things, is the focus on election day gonna be on Trump or is it gonna be on Biden? Again, my, my simple sort of binary here is that whichever candidate the election is a referendum on will lose. If it's a referendum on Biden, he will lose. If it's a referendum on Trump, he will lose. I think the Republicans are, are making an error by nominating somebody who has such high levels of toxicity with the American public. I think if you ran generic Republican against Biden, I think that generic Republican wins. Uh, I've said first party to sanity wins, but it looks like both parties are determined, bound to determine, to run directly headlong into trees. And so it's, uh, you know, amusing, but, but not, not all that amusing. It's a serious world. Thank you. Howdy. Um, over the last couple of weeks, I've heard you make multiple justifications 
for the carnage, the death, the despair, the now over 10,000 Palestinian people that have been slaughtered, refugee camps that have been bombed with one-ton bombs, US-made bombs, people picking up the body parts of their children and putting them in bags because they can't find every bit of their family's remains. And you have made the justification that it's worth it if Hamas is wiped out. I want to do a thought experiment for the audience. You push a button right now, Hamas is gone from the earth. Call it whatever you want, it's gone. What do Israeli-Palestinian relations look like? So the answer is that it's No, I'm gonna tell much, you the answer. Well then that's not a question. No, I have, that, that was my framing of the question. At a certain then, point, so the answer, as long as you get to a question mark at the end, we're good. There's a question. Okay. What Sometime the, in the near future. What, what does the West Bank look like? Who administers the West Bank? You know, I got the question. It's the Palestinian Authority who cooperates, they're docile, they work with the Israeli government. In what, and what way? And what do you see in the West Bank? Day in, day out, ethnic cleansing. Uh, People getting kicked out of their homes. In the middle of the night, the it, Israeli Defense Force. Is the there Orwellian, a Listen, okay. the no, question's I know, coming no. very soon, sir. I, I appreciate your time. Listen, people being pulled out of their homes, watching their homes demolished while their children cry. Where's the question? The question is, do Palestinians have the right to defend themselves? So can I ask a, a quick counter question? If by Palestinians defending themselves, is Hamas a terrorist group? Sure. Should Hamas surrender tomorrow? It's not for me to say. <laughs> okay, so. Should, here, should Israel so here's, stop so, so, no, 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 hold, on, hold on a no, second. No, 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 no. You, you got to talk for, for several minutes and spew complete bullshit. So now it's my turn. So, because that's how this works. This is a dialogue. This is a dialogue. No, so let me explain, okay? Here is my perspective. My perspective on this is very clear, which is that what, ha what is happening right now in Gaza is horrific and a tragedy, and every ounce of blood that is being spilled is on Hamas. Hamas initiated this conflict. There was a ceasefire all the way up till October 6th. On October 7th, they stormed into Israel, murdered 1,500 people, and took 200 people hostage back into Gaza. They then planted themselves in terror tunnels that they've spent billions of dollars building, that they robbed from their own population, underneath civilian populations, including the Al-Shifa hospital. They have hundreds of thousands of gallons of fuel underneath Al-Shifa Hospital being used solely and completely to fund their terrorism. And you say Hamas should not surrender. Now, here's the deal. The minute Hamas surrenders, the bloodshed stops. It is that simple. As far as the Palestinian Authority, the Palestinian Authority has on its books laws that pay terrorists who kill Jews. They do get actual stipends that outgross the actual yearly earnings of Palestinians. Don't, don't shake your head at me when what you're saying is factually untrue. So, what is going to happen next after Hamas is gone? The answer very much depends on whether the Palestinians ever decide to put in place a government that is willing to not attempt to genocidally exterminate the Jews. Israel pulled out of the Gaza Strip in 2005 completely. There were no Jews in the Gaza Strip in 2006. The United Nations Security Council still considers them an effective occupier when they control the ports, the air spaces, all the ter territorial Okay, so, so number one, you have You're to control- You're incorrect. They're incorrect on that fact. On what you're fact? Presenting as a fact. On it's what fact? fact? They did pull out. They pulled out physically, but they oh, controlled. but not mentally or emotionally. <laughs> no. Okay. I just explained as, how they did as, pull out. As far as the ports, as far as the airspace, of course they have to prevent the shipment in of weaponry. Why? Because every single dollar that went into the Gaza Strip was used to build the greatest terror base on planet Earth, and we are watching the consequences of that right this very instant. Israel has complete air superiority over the Gaza Strip. If Israel truly wanted to commit human rights violation, they could literally turn the place quick, into quick glass tomorrow. Sir. They quick are not doing that. Listen to me. The West Bank. Explain the settlements. Is that Hamas's fault? What, uh, what no, first, no, okay, so first you need to, so first, can we finish with the, are we done with Gaza? We're done with Gaza, so now we're moving to the West Bank. I'm not going to separate them fully, no. Of course you're not going to separate them fully because you won't even say that Hamas should surrender. I'm not in charge of Hamas. That's such a ridiculous answer. I, I, I'm not. You're not in charge of Israel either, but you're dictating policy. <laughs> That's right. As far, you as far never, You never answered my question. I'm happy to answer your question. Do as far, Palestinians have the right to defend themselves? If by defend themselves you mean murder innocent civilians, then no, I they do not. Well, clearly you do, because you don't want Hamas to surrender. No, That's what they are I doing. They are murdering that. innocent Israeli civilians. They're murdering innocent Palestinian civilians. They are murdering anyone they can find. They're literally shooting people on the roads from North Gaza to South Gaza right now to tell them to go back and act as human shields for their rockets. That is what Hamas is doing but right now, and you won't call on them to surrender. I'm done with this guy. We're no, done. Not, We're done. You're not done. We're done. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Goodbye.
Hi, Ben. Oh my gosh, I can't even believe I'm talking to you right now. I'm such a big fan. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> I like the shirt, by the way. That's very Thank funny. Thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, so right after 9-11, the whole country united. Do you believe that there has to be a large-scale terror attack, like 9-11, God forbid, um, to unite the Americans or the American youth specifically in patriotism, or is all hope lost for a united nation? Um, I hope that it doesn't take something like that. And frankly, I'm not sure that a mass terror attack in a specific area of the country would do it. I think that the, the reality is that maybe the only thing that can unite the American people at this point is a true existential foreign threat. So Israel is a good example of this just because what's happening right now is a true existential threat to the state of Israel. It's not just a massive terror attack. Israel's experienced many of those. It's that Israel has on multiple borders serious existential threats. The United States, we are the luckiest people in the history of the world. Seriously, America is blessed by God. We have on two sides of ocean. <laughs> That's true economically, and it's true morally. It's just it's an amazing place. But geographically speaking, we're blessed on two sides by ocean, one side by Canadians and one side by Mexicans. And so what that means is that there are no true existential threats to the United States, and we don't tend to feel it that way. And what usually causes unity is a feeling of existential threat, which is why, since the fall of the Soviet Union, there really has been no serious internal unity in the United States. Now, it's unfortunate that that's sometimes what it takes. The, the, the threat of a rising China could theoretically create something like that. But it's, you know, I think that the future of the United States, if we are to unify in a way that doesn't require serious violence, which God forbid, uh, then I think that what's going to have to happen is a devolution of authority to more local levels, a minimization of the federal government, and then everybody's just going to be like, okay, I don't really care as a person in Wisconsin what's happening in California, and I don't really care as a person in Florida what's happening in California, and vice versa. And that way we can say, okay, you know what, we have sort of a baseline level of things that we agree with, things like free speech or freedom of practice of religion, and otherwise we're just going to leave each other alone. That's the only way that you're going to get true unity in the United States, but I mean, yes, I think that as the country divides, the seriousness of what it would take to, to bring us back together grows, and that's, that's a scary thing for sure. Thank you. You're the best. Thank you. Sorry. It's a first aid. Hands to yourself. Yeah. There, there yeah. Go. <laughs> Whenever conservatives talk about the Middle East, they, all, they often like to champion around the superiority of Western values, those of freedom of expression, freedom of speech. I agree wholeheartedly with all of these things, but I think we've seen in a couple months prior to this, for anyone with a good memory, uh, that conservatives have been, in a certain way, very much against freedom ex of expression, specifically a certain kind of expression, which is, I would say, gender expression. Uh, you on your show a couple months ago said that you thought it was fine for sort of local municipalities to say a law that would ban women from wearing a type of clothing that men wear or men wearing a type of clothing that women wear would not be sort of in the bounds of the First Amendment because the First Amendment refers to laws made by Congress. So I'm wondering, with these sort of anti-drag laws, with laws that might uh, ban people from wearing certain types of clothing, do, not, do these not go against these sort of uh, Western values of freedom of expression that conservatives usually champion and the freedom for LGBT people when we talk about in comparison to the Middle East as we have just done in this sort of... So it's a, it's a great question. I don't believe in freedom of expression. I believe in freedom of political speech. There's a difference. The founders believed in freedom of political speech as well. That didn't mean that you got to dress up naked on a street corner, right? Because the fact is that everything can theoretically be considered a form of expression. And even people who are ardent libertarian fans of freedom of expression understand that there are limits to what counts as expression, but nobody can agree on exactly what those limits are. As far as what I've said about local localism, one of the things that I'm very big on, obviously, is localism. And we see this in, for example, in HOA. In your HOA, in our HOA, for example, you can't just post anything you want in your window. There's an agreement with the people who live in the neighborhood that you're not allowed to just put whatever you want on your front lawn. You can't just park a rusted van on your front lawn, for example. There's nothing that violates freedom of expression or freedom of speech about that. That's what your local community has decided. Now, as you abstract that out, to a broader and broader level, the freedom has to grow from that level of government because there is less homogeneity as you move up the chain. So I'm very much in favor of the idea that local communities get to make decisions for themselves on a local level, but as you abstract up the chain with more and more people who are not like you, the government has to take a lighter and lighter hand. So when it comes to, for example, broad statements like freedom of speech or freedom of expression, I would say that not every space, I mean the Supreme Court has said this, not every space is created equivalent in these circumstances, right? In your apartment building, you can't just stand in the bottom floor and hand out political literature very often, right? I mean, the, the person 
who runs the apartment building will kick you out. You're not allowed to do that. There are certain spaces that are considered okay for this and certain spaces that are not considered okay for this. So the idea, again, that there's sort of a flat, one-size-fits-all freedom of speech provision, and it doesn't rely on place, and it doesn't rely on locality, and it doesn't rely on le le level of government, it, it doesn't speak to how government actually works or the aspirations of, of human beings. I think, for example, that zoning laws are a pretty great way of preventing, quote unquote, freedom of expression. And I think that local communities should be able to, for example, not have a pot shop directly next to a school. And it's a pretty significant encroachment on, on the pot shop's freedom of expression. They can't even sell their pot right next to the school. But Again, I think that we, we, get, we, we understand that when it comes to local communities making rules for themselves, because you have the ability to do what I did, right? I didn't like the rules in California, so I got up and I moved. In the United States, I can't really do that, right? That's why I'm very, very skeptical of free speech laws at the federal level, but I'm much less skeptical when it comes to a local school board deciding what it wants to teach. If I don't like it, I can always move to the next town. Yeah. Uh, I mean, some of those don't really fit within the bounds. If you want to talk about like an apartment building, obviously that's a private residence. Free speech just doesn't really apply okay, there. Okay, but there are time, space, and manner restrictions even at the University of Wisconsin, right? Uh, sure. There right, I mean, there's is. a public school in here. If you protest right now and you start screaming and disrupting, they'll take you out. That's, that's expression. Yeah. Um, but I, I wonder if, like, let's say you had a neighborhood in California, they said, you know, we're really offended by all of these MAG hats, we're going to ban you. If you, maybe a city, maybe even a state did this, like, if you wear one, we're going to throw you in jail. Obviously, we're opposed to this. I'm not sure I, if I get the argument that, like, the more you shrink it down, the less freedoms you have. Well, the more you shrink it down, the more, the more ability you have to shape the community around you. In your family, for example, you have a lot of ability to shape the community around you. As far as MAGA hats, again, when it comes to core political expression, that is what the founders were attempting to preserve. And I think that we've now broadened that out to include everything up to and including your ability to view pornography, which I don't consider core political expression, and neither were the founders. Um, well, it's kind of an interesting point. I wonder if political expression, just your ability uh, to like wear certain things, even the act of wearing those things, you could argue, is like sort of a form of protest against the ability to wear these things. Uh, for example, uh, Matt Walsh, who's you know, kind of a... I don't know, a friend of yours. Uh, you've said you've hated him several times, so, you know. I'm oh, no, no, sure. no. Knowles I hate. Walsh I'm indifferent about. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> um, he wants, so I remember Lizzo had some drag queens on stage, and he said, like, lock her up because there was an anti-drag bill in Tennessee. But I would say that's sort of a, I would think it's fair to say she was making a political statement Well, the, the anti, the, she was making a political statement. The anti-drag bill was directed at exposure in front of children. Mm -hmm. Right, that's what the law actually was. It was exposure of people dancing in, in sexualized outfits in front of children. That's, that's what it was. And so she was doing it in front of kids. If she did it in front of adults, I think that's protected by the First Amendment. But yeah. you can see, like, bottom line, I don't think your question's bad. I just think that it's a little messier than I think that everybody wants to make it out to be. Sure. I, I'm not sure with the, um, <laughs> the whole children thing. Um, I want, <laughs> okay. Um, but it's like, I don't know how much we can sort of shrink, like, expression when it comes to kids. Like, I'm very skeptical of, like, um, like ratings for movies, for comics, the comics code. Like, how much can we shrink free speech just because children are watching? Oh, I think like, an awful lot. I mean, depending on how exactly we're appealing to kids, I think it's very, very important. I appreciate the, okay. I appreciate the question. In the history of modern Western culture, which was the greatest witch hunt? The trial of Trump? The trial of Galileo? Or the Salem witch trials? <laughs> In terms of personal impact, the Salem witch trials because they got burned. In terms, of, <laughs> in terms of impact on the world, the trial of Galileo because it delayed science by probably 50 to 100 years. And in terms of scope, then probably the, the attempt to, to go after Trump for stuff like Russian disinformation. The, 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 the fact that, that Trump has been exposed to what he's been exposed to is ridiculous. It's exposed the media as an institution, as a dishonest institution from top to bottom. Uh, it's exposed parts of our government as completely run by people with political motivations. And it really is quite astonishing and disgusting and is going to have some pretty long lasting impact uh, in, in the United States government. Uh, with that said, I, I will say that three of the four trials against Trump right now are complete nonsense. The, the one about classified documents is only nonsense because Hillary Clinton should be in jail. Um, but if Hillary Clinton... <laughs> with that... With that said, I'm always, uh, I'm always slightly bemused by the fact that the President Trump has an unfortunate habit of just jumping on every rake in sight. 
Like, you could have just not done that. Like, that would have made everybody's life a little bit easier. Like, I, I, I understand that, that they're going after him for political reasons, and I agree they're going after him for political reasons, and they should not. Also, if you know you have the world's biggest target, maybe in history, painted on you, probably now's not the time to be like, I really like this document, I'm taking it, um, I'm gonna show it to my friends on tape. Like, that, that's, that's like, the, that, like the, the best move. <laughs> I appreciate it. I'd like to hear you mention Galileo more often on the radio. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Shapiro. Thanks for coming out. Um, I read an article the other day about how you intend to start a career in acting with a breakout role as all seven dwarves in the Daily Wire's remake of the Snow White franchise. I'm wondering, you know, as a protector of children, as, you as you've kind of presented yourself to be, do you think that this might cause some confusion or discomfort in the, daily, in the in intended audience of the children's platform you've assembled? And have you considered the role of Snow White as well? <laughs> So I, too, enjoy the Babylon Bee, which is where that article is from. Um, awesome. As, as far as playing all seven dwarves, all I can say is that the casting is still in the air. You know, like, I, I wouldn't want to hog all the screen time. And as far as playing Snow White, there were two requirements in, in the actual story. One is that she be a female, so I don't qualify. And the other is that she is supposed to be, I mean, it's the rare fairy tale where actually the race is mentioned. She's supposed to be white, so Rachel Zegler doesn't qualify. So that's the, uh, that, that is it. that's the story with, uh, with our Snow White. I look okay. forward to presenting Thank it to the Thank you, Short Prince. Howdy. Uh, long time watcher, actually. Uh, so recently, you, uh, your company purchased the rights to the Atlas Shrugged movie. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to know first how that's going along. And then secondly, your company, being the fastest growing conservative podcast in America, uh, right-wing conservative, religious, you an Orthodox Jew, um, a few Catholics, Protestants, highly religious. The book itself has a lot of themes that are not antithetical to the religious side, specifically adultery, greed, pride. These things are put on display as goods, not bads. So I was worried, and a large amount of the objectivists were worried, that you might be Christian-washing the book. We were just hoping that are you going to be keeping it? So I'm not personally writing the script. Right. Um, as far as, as, far as you know, the people who, I, we're not far enough in, along in the development process uh, to, to kind of give you an answer as to like the specifics on it, but I think the idea is that it's going to be true to the book. I mean, all of us, even those of us who disagree with objectivism, and I have severe disagreements with objectivism, if you want to watch me debate your own book about this, right, we had a long conversation about this. Um, you know, I think that the, the people who get, sold us the rights obviously have a large stake in us being as accurate as possible to the themes of the book, even if we disagree with the themes of the book. So in moving forward with that, 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 that would be our intention. Cool, and one last question. Could you consider Ryan Gosling for Hank Reardon by any chance? I think you'd be a perfect <laughs> actor for that role. Uh, well, I mean, we're gonna need a few more subscribers before we can afford Ryan Gosling in that role. <laughs> uh, hello, Ben, it's so nice to meet you. Uh, I've I was living in Korea uh, in middle school, and I came upon your videos in 2016 during the Trump election, and I thought you're probably the smartest man alive. Um, fast forward a few years, you're one of the most uh, influential conservatives in the world, and uh, personally, as a Christian, I pray that one day you come to faith in Jesus. That's nice of you. I appreciate it. Uh, seriously. Yeah. Uh, I'd yeah. rather you pray for that than pray for what most of my other opponents pray for. So. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want you to go to hell. Right. So, <laughs> I know, that's why I appreciate the sentiment. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, my question is, uh, what is your ultimate objective or goal you aim to fulfill through your career, and uh, what motivates you the most? So, I mean, the, the thing that I hope to do, obviously, which I try to do every day, uh, is bring as much truth as I can to an audience, even when they don't like it. One of the things I sort of pride myself on in doing the show is that there are going to be times where I piss off my audience because I disagree with what, what I know many of them think. And if I think that it's true, I'm going to try and say it anyway. And so I really take a lot of pride in that. But as far as sort of broadening out the, the scope of who conservatism appeals to, that's something I'm also very much focused on, which is... Why, for example, I hope that in the future we're going to be doing you know, foreign language stuff, because I don't think the language of conservatism is specific to English. I think that that would be a great thing to do. Our, our goal in the end is obviously to convert as many people as we can uh, to, to the political and Judeo-Christian worldview that we think is correct uh, in life and, and bring people fulfillment that way. I mean, that, that's the goal. I think we've been successful in doing that so far, but I hope that we're only just beginning in that, in that process. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.
Hey, good evening, Ben. Good evening, fellow Americans. My name is Michael Gomez. I'm a master's student at Columbia University, and well, I'm the political director for Valentina Gomez. She's running for secretary of state in the state of Missouri. And well, my question for you, Ben, is how do we begin exposing and prosecuting the people and the bands like BLM uh, that start breaking down our offices, uh, our government offices are preaching to the White House and, take, and dressing up as women and taking over women's sports? Because I'm a former NCAA Division I swimmer, so is my sister, brother's an Olympian. How do we begin cracking down on these men that dress up as women and try to force everybody to call them a woman. Well, I mean, I, I do think that you are starting to see incredible success in this particular field. So there are a lot of states that have now moved to outlaw men competing in women's sports, and we're gonna need to see a lot more of that. I think it's a very, very good thing, obviously. I think that the next Republican president is going to do something along federal lines, whatever he can do along federal lines that has to do with protecting women in women's sports. I mean, if we are to have women's sports, obviously it only makes sense for, for women to compete in them, not dudes who are dressed as ladies. Uh, as far as you know, cracking down on criminal activity, one of the great, one one of the great, I think, betrayals of American law enforcement over the last, over my entire lifetime, has been the failure to prosecute people who are rioting en masse during the Black Lives Matter riots of 2020. I think that it's it's opened a can of worms that has not yet been closed, which is why you saw mass vandalism, for example, over the weekend in Washington D.C. by pro Hamas rallyers. They, you know, they, once people believe that they can do this sort of stuff and get away with it, they tend to do a lot of it. Right? That, that's been known for a very long time. It's James Q. Wilson's broken windows theory about crime. And so the only way to stop this is that a bunch of people are going to have to get arrested, and they should be arrested if. They if they're engaged in vandalism, if they're engaged in property destruction, if they're engaged in violence, they should go to jail. End of story. Okay. Thank you, Ben. God bless, oh. God, God bless America. God bless Israel. Thank, hey, thank you. you. I appreciate it. We have time for one more final question. Hey, Mr. Shapiro. So I actually need your help with something. So, uh, uh -oh. so don't worry, don't <laughs> worry about it. So September 2020, you pretty much tweeted saying, I don't know who won this debate, but I know we lost. Four years on, looks like we're gonna have maybe these same candidates. And this country's become more polarized than ever. And it seems like we're really choosing the best of the worst. A year from now, it's gonna be election day. Why should I get out of my bed to go vote? Uh, you should get, a, it's a great question, given the fact that again, both parties seem intent on nominating geriatric, people who should probably not be in the office. Uh, you know, it's, again, I, I could not be less satisfied with the candidates that are being presented to the American public for the third straight election cycle. Uh, it's, uh, it, from, from Hill, I didn't vote, to be honest, in 2016, I, I publicly did not vote. I said neither of these candidates meets my baseline qualifications to be president of the United States. And then I was pleasantly surprised by a lot of Trump's governance between 2016 and 2020. And so I voted for him in 2020 with the full scale knowledge that everything I had said about him on character still applied. Uh, and when it comes to 2024, the bottom line is that the governing strategy of the two sides is very different. Putting aside the personalities and my own personal distaste for a lot of the personalities involved, the governing strategy is going to be very different. And you're going to have to make a decision as to which way you would like the United States governed. There are certain things that are exaggerated. Both sides are going to spend oodles and oodles of money. But, for example, the attempt to inject, I mean, this is Joe Biden's program, to inject equity into all forms of American government, that every piece of American government is going to be injected with the false premise that inequality of outcome is evidence of exploitation or discrimination. Right? Joe Biden has pledged to put that in every part of government. Donald Trump obviously would not if he's the nominee. Right? Hopefully, listen, from my perspective, I hope that he's not the nominee. Right? I, hope that it, I hope that it's DeSantis or even Nikki Haley. But if, it, but if it is Donald Trump, then Donald Trump pursued an economic policy that was significantly friendlier to business. Donald Trump pursued a foreign policy that made our enemies afraid, as opposed to our current foreign policy, which seems to be incentivizing and emboldening literally every single one of our enemies, which is why we have fires started everywhere in the world. Do I think that stuff is important? I do think that stuff is important. And as much personal, personal distaste as I have for our political class in general, I do think it matters who you vote for. So I won't be sitting 2024 out in the way that I did 2016. Okay. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Well. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate your time tonight. It's great to see you. Are you tired of the lies and the twists of the mainstream media talking points? Yeah, me too. Join me in my newest series, Fact, where I dismantle and bring truth to this tiring mainstream agenda.